<clears throat> so welcome all to the virtual seed computational biology seminar series. And um, today we have the pleasure to have uh, Lars um, Malström, a group leader and life scientist specialist uh, at the service and support uh, for science IT, called F3IT, of the University of Zurich. Um, I will briefly go through your uh, bio. Uh, trained as chemical engineer at uh, Lund University, Lars obtained his PhD in 2005 uh, in electri electrical engineering at the University of Washington in the US. Uh, from the 2006 to 2008, um, he was a postdoctoral research assistant in David uh, Goodlett's lab at the University of Washington as well. And in 2008, he became group leader at the Institute for, Mo for Molecular Systems Biology at the ETH de Zurich until he moved in 2014 uh, to the Service and Support for Science IT. Um, Briefly, last areas of expertise are system biology, mass spectrometry, protein structure prediction, and data management. It also provides services such as consulting, uh, proposal writing, and application support. Um, today, uh, Lars is going to explain to us how one can study host pathogen interaction using protein structure modeling and chemical cross linking mass spectrometry. Uh, Lars, thank you for coming to Lausanne, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Diana. So I'd like to start by thanking uh, SIB and for the opportunity to organize this for a well-organized seminar. And of course, I'd like to thank everyone who's here and also joining us online. Um, so today's talk is really applied. Um, most of the methods in here are actually published, so if you're interested in them, more technological aspects of what we do, uh, those will be in paper form and not in the presentation today, unfortunately. But what I will try to um, tell you today, essentially, is, is this interplay between data collection, data modeling to drive hypothesis generation, and that these hypotheses then are testable. Uh, so for that, we need a system that's so working on it human pathogen, it's called Streptococcus pyogenes. It lives in the oral cavity of about 30% of humans. So it's very, very, very common. Uh, about 700 million of us get mild infections every year, so this is strep throat. Um, and of course, this disease is not very deadly. And uh, luckily, both for humans, but also for the scientists, this thing is very susceptible to penicillin and hence doesn't really constitute a threat, which means that it's very cheap to do experiments on, and so it fits bioinformaticians in that sense. Uh, it is, however, also interesting because at some you know, frequency, it actually gets into the blood. Um, that actually happens very often, pretty much every time you brush your teeth, you'll have bacterial pieces entering into your blood. Of course, in general, it's not a problem. In this case, um, since it's so common, this probably happens more than a number of times, and very few of these times there is some infection established. So we have about 1.2 to 2 million infections, or very severe infections per year, and these are mostly in the third world, but the Western world is not completely excluded. Uh, and once it's established in your blood, mortality rate is very high, so between 25 and 40 percent, depending on study. All right, so surface of bacteria is obviously where the action happens. So here is a mock-up of what this looks like. So you have a cell membrane, here's the cell wall, and then you have proteins, bacterial proteins that are attached either to the cell wall or secreted, and they interact with proteins from the host. So here are two very common blood proteins, indigen um, albumin, for example. And of course, if you photograph this thing uh, micro, with an electron microscopy, this looks like this way, where you have the surface. I don't know if you can see up here, there is a sort of faint gray layer. That's these very long M proteins. So this, this bacteria actually has this bacteria. Um, once you add it plasma to this, and you do the same micrograph, you see there's a huge, thick, sort of darker gray layer here, and that's actually the plasma proteins. So this thing is completely covered by the host proteins, and this is very likely a strategy to avoid detection. 
And so we want to understand the function of, of this layer, this particular interaction layer, how the host, the bacteria interacts with the host, but also how the host responds to the bacteria. And so this is sort of the, my little systems biology slide. I'm sure you all know it, but I'll go through it real quick. So you have some large system, very complicated, can't really be measured directly, at least not the technique that I prefer. So we fragment this either by, by proteases or by, by sharing DNA, for example. Uh, and then you can do some things to it. You can perturb the living system or you can fractionate the system once you lysed it, and so on and so forth. And you can measure that by mass spectrometry and, of course, um, use the DNA and use the genome sequencing to get to the underlying DNA code that. that drives the virulence of these things. And so then you digitize them, uh, and you end up having a lot of data, which you stored and integrated into some simple statistics. And then you try to create some models, and there is an infinite number of models. And ideally, these models will generate hypotheses that you can then go back to the lab and test. And so you have this sort of iterative approach where your hypothesis gets better and better, uh, and the things that you discover gets better and better more interesting. So more specifically, mass spectrometry is one of the techniques we use. Um, this is just an example of the techniques we're using. This can be a global cell lysate. Um, we digitize that simply by separating or cutting the proteins into peptides, separating peptides with liquid chromatography, and then measuring it in mass spectrometry. And essentially, you can fragment the peptides and record all the fragments. And from that, you can puzzle together essentially two things. One is the, the identity of the peptides. And since most peptides are unique in the genome, you can also locate which protein that peptide came from. Uh, and the other thing you can read out from mass spectrometer data essentially is, is quantitative value. Now, it's not a, an absolute value. It's a relative value. So you can only use it to compare two samples with each other. And of course, you can generate heat maps, and you can do this sort of clustering, and you can see certain proteins are more highly related than others, and certain samples are more related than others. Uh, and so you can now do this many, many times. Here is one example I'll go through really briefly. Uh, take the opportunity to advertise a talk that I have at BC, at BC2, where I will talk a lot more about this particular project. But in this case, we've taken 34 strains. Some of them were invasive, so isolated from blood. Others were isolated from the oral cavity uh, in the same region during the same time period. Uh, and then we just genome sequence them, and we create a composite genome simply by aligning them. They're all very, very similar. Uh, and of course, we can mark out now the regions of where these strains differ. And so then we can go um, and measure those with this swath MS. Uh, and what you can see now is that you have samples that are, or spaces that are related, and then proteins that are related. In this particular case, the blue ones are the non-invasive ones, and the red ones are the invasive ones. And so already here, you can sort of see two things. First of all, there seems to be two major groups, and those two major groups, so this group over here, this group over here, they are mixed. They are, have contained both invasive and non-invasive bacteria. Um, but within those groups, you have subgroups. And with a little bit of imagination, maybe you can sort of see that there is some information in this protein complement to actually identify uh, virulent strains. So we're still working on sorting into all the details. But this gives you an opportunity now to, to since you have information about virulence, in these particular data sets, uh, you can start to look at the proteins. And what you can see, if you, if you squint, is that there are some proteins that seem to be higher in the non-invasive strains and lower in the invasive strains, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. And so this will give you some information about the mechanism, perhaps. perhaps. So if you then scale this to, to some much larger system where you have more experiments and more samples, in this case, we have it's a little bit dated numbers. We probably have 5,000 genes by now. Uh, and we probably injected sort of 20,000 mass spec injections. Uh, then you have some computational tools. 
and then you have lots of online databases, and then you would want to integrate these and make some, some simple model. And this model that I'm building here is an association model, and it really comes down to taking clusters, and any two proteins that belong to the same cluster get an association score. And then you do this over tens of thousands of, of uh, data sets, databases, or, 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 or um, computational results from, from your normal bioinformatics um, tool set, and then you compute association between every single protein, you throw it into a sort of forest graph model, and you constrain it by protein localization. So mass spectrometry, we are actually able to isolate proteins that are in the cell wall of cell membrane. We can isolate whatever comes on the outside by shaving the bacteria with proteases. And of course, everything else will be counted as intracellular. And so you end up with a little model like this, um, where you have sort of the cell wall or the exposed area up here. And then for clarity, we put sort of DNA associated uh, proteins down at the bottom here. And then you can use this thing to sort of figure out relative distance between proteins. Um, and so to make it a little bit more concrete, this is now protein N. And it's now associated with proteins that are largely on the surface. And what you can see, so protein M is known to interact with several uh, ligands in human blood. Uh, the peptidases here are used to cut certain hypermolecules uh, that the host is throwing at the bacteria. And you have something that also is binding sort of macroglobulins, for example, or fibronectin. Um, so this is sort of all proteins that are or carrying out their function in, in, in the blood when, when they are in blood. <laughs> um, and luckily for us, there was a hypothetical protein that came up in this particular model. So these associations shouldn't be confused with protein-protein interactions. They're simply a result of this sort of concept of dividing proteins into many, many groups. And whenever two proteins show up in the same group, they are counted as associated. So for example, um, some of the things that were particularly useful in this model is that some of these proteins are more abundant in virulent strains. Uh, some of them, or most of them, are upregulated when exposed to human plasma, which no, is a known assay for virulence. Uh, and then, of course, they're primarily found at the cell surface or in the secreted uh, tools. So, to make these models a little bit more interesting by using sort of structural modeling, in this case, it's almost exclusively homology modeling, but it's the same concept as de novo modeling. And the way that we do it is to estimate the local conformation of every single segment of the protein using fragments, as represented here. So, for example, this is amino acid 1 to 9, and this would be 2 to 10, and so on and so forth. And now you can rephrase protein structure modeling into Monte Carlo search. So, essentially, what you do is you replace randomly one part of the molecule with this local conformation, and then you estimate the energy with a statistical potential. Um, and then you end up with, um, since it's such a fast, uh, it's a fast algorithm, you can do this tens or hundreds of thousands of times, since we end up with large clouds. Of course, this is a known structure because this is RMSD, so you can see that, yes, indeed, in certain cases, a few cases, perhaps, um, mm -hmm. you have some good correlation between your Statistical potential and the quality of the model, uh, but you also have false, false uh, minimas. And it does indeed work, and this is getting really old now, but um, the double blind prediction we have, so I used to participate in Nelson Baker's lab, um, we were able to get a protein that was below two angstroms, or it's a short protein. Um, and since then, we've been able to model bigger proteins with accuracy, even though modeling at this resolution still still remains pretty uncommon. And so now you can build sort of a, a, a little bit more um, uh, explicit model. This is, a, this is really a mock-up, so we haven't done any minimization on it for the simple reason that we don't have the compute power to do it. Um, we might get there one day, but for now it simply remains handy. Um, and so this thing here represents kind of this particular 
this particular interaction or association network. Um, so it is a pathological protein turned out to be pretty interesting. So first of all, um, it is highly expressed in virulent strains. It is mostly found on the outside of bacteria, so in the secreted pool. Um, and there was a transposon study where they knocked out the majority of the non-essential genes and then tested for growth rates in blood. Uh, this particular protein was uh, important for survival. Whereas in most molecular studies, if it's hypothetical, it's grossly overlooked, and they never even cared about it. But the hypothesis is that this protein is interacting with the human plasma in some way to aid survival in blood. And so, on to sort of the next mass spectrometry uh, technology here. In this particular case, it's called affinity purification mass spectrometry. Um, and so the concept is that you take a protein and you express it. In this case, we use E. coli expression systems, and we put a tag on it, and then we simply dip this thing into human blood and pull down that protein with all its interactors, and then we use some statistics to figure out which proteins are significantly interacting with your protein of interest. And in this particular case, we had nine or so, I think it's nine, eight or nine interactors. Um, are from blood, and as you can see, they're varied. So some of them from complement proteins, some of them are trypsin inhibitors, some of them are involved in transport or in regulation. Uh, and then we have this HRG, um, which turned out to be really interesting because it's a known like a protein that is indeed uh, involved in pathogen. And it has been shown to kill Streptococcus cryogenes. And this particular interaction we did confirm with uh, with a bioquare. Um, and it does indeed do the job. So in this particular case, um, you have bacterial strains. This is almost like the, the, the reference here at 0% HRD. You have, by definition, 100% survival. And as you add more HRD, uh, you can see its survival goes to zero or close to zero. And then if you, if you grow this bacteria at non-permissible um, <coughs> concentration of HRG, and you add SHIP back, at some point you, regain, you recover some of the survival. Um, and so in this, indeed, SRG, right, SHIP is inhibiting the main function of uh, HRG. Uh, and also an important aspect of this is that we did detect antibodies against this ship protein in patients. So three out of six that were that had sepsis or had an invasive bacteria, and zero of eight patients with non-invasive infections. So I can conclude that it is indeed involved in some type of uh, survival aiding uh, function. So of course, what's next? would like to know all the details on how SHIP neutralizes HRG, and this might allow you to design a drug that inhibits SHIP by uh, letting HRG kill the bacteria. And of course, we want to have a atomic resolution model, these two proteins interacting. Um, this is still work in progress. So instead, I will, I will share with you a new technology that we are developing right now, actually. Um, that will allow you to do this without actually doing crystallization. Um, and as to no one's surprise, it's mass spectrometry based. This may be as also it's targeted for eomics. So um, there is this M protein and fibrinogen, engine, their interaction is actually known. Um, and so if you know if you know the structure, you can compute the distance between any two amino acids very trivially. And if you combine that with cross-linking mass spectrometry, which is explained really quickly, um, essentially you use a, a molecule, in this case ESS, it interacts with lysines. <coughs> and so if you allow it to interact with your system, in some cases it interacts with a lysine from two different protein chains. And so now you can go and identify that with mass spectrometer. Um, and with that ID, we can define the maximum distance between these two lysines. And um, so in this case, I'm just going to do sort of a, a, an assumption here that you have 
two models. These are not Rosetta models. These are just made up. One is, of course, the real confirmation, and one is a fake one. You can now compute all the lysine and lysine distances. So in this particular case, the green one here, which is the, the correct confirmation, have 39 potential crosslinks or lysine and lysine crosslinks. Um, and in the incorrect confirmation, uh, you have um, 18 potential crosslinks. And so now you can use a spectrometer to go and actually forward, actually go and target these particular crosslinks. Now I should have probably mentioned that these are isotope coded, so we have a light and a heavy form. And what you would expect, of course, is that they will behave exactly the same, both in the very similarly in the, in the separation steps, about behave identically in the mass spectrometer. And so, <clears throat> what I'm trying to show here is now those uh, a dose response experiment where we go from from zero percent crosslinker down here up to two thousand micromolar, and then. They, these are like six conditions, and they are represented here as 12 ion chromatograms. Ion chromatograms is really just a, a time chromatogram where the, the y axis is an intensity. And of course, they're paired, so the lights are red and the heavies are blue. And you can see that your, your vast majority of the signal is actually light. And that is as expected, more common to see. The light versions have more signal in the light sing in the light channels than the heavy channels, but you have these doublets that obviously are not present in zero percent micromolar, but are coming strongly uh, at some later time point. And if you if you look at these profiles, I'm sort of cut this little part out here, and I'm showing it from the side now, uh, and trying to be a little bit smart with the colors, um, sort of have blue, light blue, and heavy blue. Blue and dark blue, where uh, you can see that they are indeed uh, reasonably similar profiles. That's what you want, and also they're slightly shifted in time, which is also what you want. And so you can see that with a little bit of imagination, you might perhaps see that most of these are actually looking reasonably correlated, reasonably similar. And if you simply calculate the area of some of these curves. Uh, you get uh, that they're pretty similar in intensity. So now you have all the pieces you need to write a score. Uh, and so we wrote a very, very naive one. And it needs some improvement. But this particular, uh, and this particular peptide uh, is actually the crosslinks between these lysines here and these lysines here, and it's within cross-linkable distance. In general, um, we measured these at the C beta, C beta distances, and that includes the, the DSS, which is just 11 angstroms, but also the lysine side chains, which are about 7 angstroms. It is a cross linkable distance. So now, if you go and do the experiment and you actually target all of these cross links, in this case, there were a total of uh, yeah, 60 or so, which is you can target all of those in a, in a in a single injection. Uh, the score, as I said, was very naive, so we ended up with quite a few uh, positives. So the, both the blue and the red ones were scored positive in this case. Um, and by hand, which of course no one in this room will, will ever buy if they get to review this paper, uh, we did some manual validation. And we can only validate five out of the eight that scored positively in the correct and zero in the non-correct. No one uh, would believe that. So <laughs> that's still work in progress. We, we have, do have a new score that works a little bit better, but we're still, we're still adding some features to it. Right. So just using the data, data having seen that pass through the score filters. This distance is not sufficient as a filter. Right, right. So just you know, right, right, right. in the case where, where all of these are models, which I'll show you in a bit, 
then you you wouldn't really know which one to choose, right? So what, what, what we're doing here, and this is the key, if, you, if you've ever looked at a normal cross-linking experiment data set, um, it is slightly disappointing in the fact that you run the cross-linking experiment in low stoichiometric settings. For the simple reason, if you over cross-link it, you create a ball that cannot be digested, and so you can't measure it. So in general, they aim to get about one crosslink per protein pair. And so with combinatorics, you are literally creating the needle in the haystack <laughs> before we even start. So if you look at these data sets, in general, there are two to 10 crosslink peptides out of the 30,000 they got sequenced. So you have a really bad uh, situation where you, where you have um, it actually becomes really tricky to score this data because you have so much stuff that just isn't cross-linked. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons why all cross mass spectrometry crosslinking experiments are done on highly, highly purified systems. So they spend about two years, three years to get the system conditions right, and then the mass spectrometry, and then it's hard to, hard to measure and hard to analyze. And so, of course, here, the idea is that you make models because in that case, in the first case, you assume that you know nothing about the system. In the reality, we know a lot. So we, we know that the proteins very often, especially if you work in interaction between pathogenic bacteria and blood proteins, you have a lot of known structures. So the fact that you have all this information is completely lost in the normal way of doing cross experiments. And here we're trying to find a way to use this information to our advantage. So now, of course, we, we, we measure every single potential crosslink, whether or not it's there. And so now the, 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 the case is that you can know, instead of doing discovery, you're doing model selection, essentially. That's the, that's the idea. And so, as I said, these were all sort of faked models, high mole moving some, some change around, so it's pretty ugly. Uh, but of course, you can do protein protein knocking these days. Uh, it actually works reasonably well if you have a crystal structure, <laughs> the packing is all correct, then you have a bit of time in it. Uh, in the other cases, you have very, very high, high noise levels. So, again, the idea is exactly the same as for normal modeling. You perturb the confirmation by rotation and translation, you optimize the side chains, and then you determine uh, the, the quality of a model with this statistical-based energy function, and then you get these rugged sort of low energy confirmations. Um, and in general, with Capri, which is a little bit blind, you need 20 or so models uh, if the system is easy. Um, but at least there is some hope that we get close. And that's really that short seminar today more with conclusions so uh, large amounts of diverse data can be used to create usable models for like the systems um, of course in this case we have really a large amount of data and a very very simple system of uh, I haven't tried this on anything more complex than 2000 open reading frames so <laughs> still a uh, small system I don't know how much data you would need complex. Um, target that are identified using this model can be expressed and initially defined binding part and it's just affinity purification mass spectrometry. And then perhaps uh, the more interesting part of uh, these model of interactions can be used to guide having a cross link and mass spectrometry data acquisition and data interpretation. So of course Lots and lots of co-workers uh, to mention um, Rudy for the opportunity of doing this work, Abdullah for doing some of the modeling, and Simon Halvey for most of the mass spec work. But everyone here pretty much involved in either workflow, data management, data position, or 